I'm Roger Misso, and this is How to Lose an Election. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of How to Lose an Election. I just want to say thank you right off the bat to the folks who have subscribed, liked the show, rated us five stars, uh, left a comment, and especially our patrons who have signed up to support the show on Patreon. I mean, you make this thing possible, so thank you. And if you haven't signed up to be a patron yet, visit our Patreon page in the show notes. I am super proud to welcome a friend a fellow veteran, a Texan to the show today, Kim Olson. Kim is a trailblazer. She was one of the first women pilots uh, in the Air Force. She's a badass. Uh, (laughs) She has run for office numerous times, school board. In 2018, she ran an incredibly close race Mm -hmm. as a Democrat in Texas statewide uh, for the Texas Agricultural uh, Agricultural Commissioner position. Mm -hmm. And in 2020, ran for the U.S. House of Representatives in Texas's 24th Congressional District. She's got a lot of lessons learned. She's just a great person. Um, I'm, I'm honored to have her on the show. And so, Kim, my first question for everybody and for you <laughs> is, can you, and I've done a little bit of it for you, but can you describe for our listeners and our viewers who you were before you were a candidate? Because you have done an awful <laughs> lot of good for this country. Well, I, to be honest, and thank you very much, Roger, for having me on board. Thank you for everybody out there that's listening. And for those that uh, are going to think for run for office, you know, take these lessons and, and, and hold them close to your heart. And, you know, Roger, I'm going to be honest, I'm a woman with uh, gray hair and I used to have altered gray hair. And I will tell you, I'm the same woman I was uh, before I ran as I am now. I am, after 25 years in the Air Force and three years here in the State Guard of Texas, I am a public servant. I want to inspire others to do great things out there. I am a um, farmer. (laughs) I grow food. I literally get my hands in the dirt. And I just think that uh, some of the skill sets us veterans bring to the table are needed in today's democracy democracy at all levels of government, not just the high end part like Congress and Senate, but clear down at the city council and the board and the school board. So I really applaud you doing uh, this work, Roger. It, it makes a big difference. Yeah, thanks. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, you've done so many incredible things throughout your career. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about why you chose to run for office and why you chose to run when you did? And I, you're one of the unique candidates in the, across the country, I think, who has the experience of running statewide in a big state, right? The state yeah. of Texas is, yeah. you know, you don't mess with it, right, for that reason. <laughs> and then you went from there to running in a primary campaign for a House seat in Texas right. in 2020. You talk about maybe what that was like and why, you know, you made the decision to run for the office as you did when you did. Well, I think like most uh, folks, you know, we all took the sucker punch in 2016 when we saw what got elected. And those of us had been around the block a couple of times and seen countries where democracy start to fall apart, saw what was about to happen. I mean, that I am not surprised at all. I'm way disappointed at four years. But, you know, so at that moment, it's like, oh, hell no, I just cannot sit on the sidelines and, and watch this thing, uh, you know, unravel. I mean, for God's sake, I spent 30 years in uniform just about, and I'll be damned if I'm going to, you know, give this country now to my children and my, I have a grandson now without fighting for, you know, all these values and ideals that you and I, Roger, and a lot of folks that are watching this hold, 
Well, dear. So, you know, the way you do that is you, you just, you jump in the political game. And for, for me, running statewide and just for perspective for those of you out there listening to how big texas is let me brag about my state y'all is that we are five georgias let me repeat that for dramatic effect we are five georgias so when people start talking about we got a georgia texas it's like yeah well get in line because it's a massive state we got 254 counties in this state and so you know democrats have been out of office for almost uh, you know three decades, and we had a great a great guy running for Senate, a guy named might have heard of him, Beto O'Rourke, and he was at the top of the ticket. And Kim Olson, I swear to God, this true story, Roger. I was like, you know, God damn it, I'm gonna get it. Sorry, I'm gonna get in there and I'm gonna I'm gonna run. And you know, I know a lot about growing stuff, so I'm gonna run for ag commissioner. And so I just sort of showed up at some. Democratic uh, poobah event up just north of me here. I swear this is a true story in Graham, Texas. Here's the here's the head of the party I'd never met. Here's the guy running for lieutenant governor. Here's another guy over there. And you know the entire ladies in comfortable tennis shoes are sitting around these round tables, and and I'm sitting there and I'm just listening because I have never given a public speech. I didn't really have my you know stump speech ready to go. Hell, I didn't know what ag all did except for grow stuff. And one of the ladies in comfortable tennis shoes looks at her, she goes, we well, are running for our office. Get up there and give them your spiel. I'm like, oh, oh no, oh, I- I'm not ready. <laughs> he goes, chairman, that she's running for ag, get her up there. And so I follow the chairman of the Democratic Party and Roger, I swear to God, it was give me agriculture or give me death. And the place went crazy. A hundred people up on their feet applauding, you know, because I was so nervous. I gave them everything. And the chairman looks at her, he goes, who the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> and his handler goes, nice job. Way to, you know, upstage the, the chairman. And from then on, I was on the road. Would you come with us to all the rural places? We kind of like the way you are. And I'm like, sure. And that sort of launched me into running. And so like Beto, I chased his ass all over this state and visited 244 counties. I didn't get to all 254. And then that sort of put me out there and I loved it. It was, but for me, I got to visit farms and family dinner tables and talk to people hanging on a fence, you know, and straw hanging out of your mouth. I'm up on combines and harvesting rice and, you know, cutting up silage and feeding things. I mean, it just, it was just, a wonderful way to see the hardworking folks at Texas. And I just, it was just incredible. And so we came close. I mean, we closed, we got beat in um, 15 by 22 points. Our governor got beat and we closed it, at least Beto did by three and I closed it to four. I mean, that's amazing when you you think about, you know, six, six to seven million people voted and you only lost by 300,000 votes. So, you know, it's like, hey, I, I'm good at this, you know, plus, you know, you fire up people, you you become a role model, which I've always done being a pilot in the military. You, you know, I, <laughs> I'm an organizer, chop, chop on time on target. This is the way it goes. And so we, we, we really ran a wonderful campaign. That was in 18. Well then, you know, 2020 rolls around, you're like, okay, I know how to do this now. Where best could I serve? Where could I make an impact? And of course, I worked in the Pentagon for five years. I did my time on the hill, you know, slugging the halls. So I understood how that whole system worked and thought, well, maybe, maybe DC could use some more vets who've been to combat. Roger, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. And, you know, understand what happens if you don't constantly reinforce your democracy and, and you know, put into law the things that we just sort of took for granted. And we saw that unfold with this disastrous administration before us. So I ran for Congress, like, you know, and there were seven of us in the primary. And in Texas, you have to have a majority, which is 50 plus one. That was seven. It's really tough. But I cleared it initially by 11 points. So I thought, I'm home free. Well, <laughs> March happened, COVID happened. We got our runoff, you know, pushed and pushed. You know, um, George Floyd happened and then the rest is history and, and I lost. And unfortunately, the person that won then would lose to the Republican. It was one of the districts that Texas could actually have swapped and it sure would have been nice. But instead, 
Texas lost every single House seat that was on the books, every single congressional seat that we went up against, a lot like those across the country. And all we did was do damage control. So it was really heartbreaking to watch in a time where you just went, oh my God, are we nuts? Um, to watch it unfold, but thank God we got the administration changed out. And then those folks in Georgia came through and we got the Senate and the House. And so, you know, it, it works. Sometimes it works. <laughs> so that that was my run. And to your point, you know, primary wasn't too bad because it was like, okay. And I thought the polling was, yeah, you were gonna, you were gonna make it. And I think I would have been honestly for for this district because it was red to blue, not blue to bluer. So I think for a red to blue, my resume and background would have been better suited to the to the voters, and we we might have swapped it. But you know, if wishes and you know that old saying, and it is what it is, and it's it's good, it's all good. So you're gonna ask me my next question because I you're so smart, you know, and I'll just segue into it. So yeah. you know, what do you do? You lose. You go home that night, and yeah. and I'll and I'll tell this story for those of you that have lost. So. The thing that was the hardest was watching your staff and they're all young and you know this. And I remember a husband saying, he said, oh my God, they're crying. I was like, there's no crying in campaigning. Come on, you know, there's no crying in the cockpit. You know, I remember that my instructor, but you know, you, you gotta let them have it. I mean, they work their butts off and if they wanna shed a few tears, then, then allow that. I didn't, I don't, I know what to cry over. You know, you bury a comrade, you weep, you weep in Arlington Cemetery. You know, you lose a troop under your command, your heart is shattered as you talk to their parents. That's the kind of shit you cry over. But you don't cry over losing an election in my world. So what you do is, you know, you thank everybody. And then I get in the car and I drive and I crawl into bed with my husband of 35 years because my family was not going to be a political casualty like we see sometimes when people begin to run for office and or serve. So that's something I would tell those of you that listen is your family at the end of the day, no matter how freaking famous you think you are and how you think your shit doesn't stink at the end of the day, it's your family and your friends around you that matter. And they love you, whether you're the damn president of the United States, whether you're a colonel or whether, you know, you get rejected. That's the thing you got to remember when you come into this game, because you got all these People, you know, the entourage around you telling how great you are. And after a while, you start to believe it. And yeah, he ain't that great. Because as soon as you lose, let me tell you what those staffers are doing. They are on the phone finding their next job and your history. So don't kid yourself, y'all. There you go. Probably a little more intel than you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is good. This is what we like, right? And I, I, I like, you know, you talk about staff or, you know, my experience was consultants telling you how great you are. And what we used to say in the military is, you know, on the Navy side, right? If uh, once you start believing your fitness reports, uh, that means that you're uh, you're too far gone, right? We lost you. So uh, it's, don't believe it's the your same own thing press. in politics, yeah. right? It really is. Like you it have is. to really make sure you have people that you can trust who are going to give it to you straight. And, yeah. You know, it sounds like you had that, or you were able to stay grounded at least, which is which is good. So, you know, you you had an interesting experience and this is something that we don't do a great job in politics of of always talking about i feel like yeah. you know on the democratic side we're real good at telling people how to run against republicans we're not real good at helping folks understand what it's like to run in a primary when mm -hmm. the stakes are a little bit more you know the the you know the the field's a little bit more murky it's dem versus dem and we agree mostly on the same big brush stroke kind of things but how how did you find it running in a democratic primary right i mean it's um you, you know disappointed that you couldn't go to the general i felt the same you know mm -hmm. felt the same way that you did about watching you know the general election unfold but yeah how how is it different you know finding disappointment in a primary knowing that you know maybe you would have had a good shot in the general election well, I think what you have to do is come to terms with, even though, and again, y'all, I'm a pilot, so I love being in control. That's just my thing. And trust me, you want me in the controls, right? When I'm in the front cockpit there. But the reality is when you begin to run and you're playing at this kind of level, you aren't in control. There are, there are forces 
within party structure, there's identity politics that goes on, there are things behind the scene. And at the end of the day, and the thing you got to live with yourself is half the time, it isn't about you. Well, all the time, it is never about you. It's that, and I'm going to, you know, pop thump the Democratic Party. Part of their problem in 2020 is they looked around and said, oh my God, we haven't done a good job growing diversity within our own party. And therefore, when they wanted or looked out at the landscape, they said, oh, my eyes, it's too, you know, <laughs> too white, my eyes. And so, and that's their fault because the gatekeepers of the status quo, those that have power like to hang on to it, they don't, they don't do what we do in the military, Roger. They do not check. You know, they do not train their replacements. I guarantee you nobody in the Democratic side of the house there is going, okay, who's going to be the next Speaker of the House? Instead, they're elbowing each other. Well, I'm going to be it. I'm going to be it. And so that's one thing you just have to understand that, that, that forces move beyond just you. And you may be the most qualified, but if you don't fix this box, that box, this color, this, that, this, that, you know, you you won't get supported. And, and you just gotta, you just gotta understand that. And you can never take it personally. There's nothing I can do about who, I, what gender I am, where I live, what my upbringing up, none of us can impact how the parents that we had, we are just on this earth and you ought to just do the best you can with what you have. And I, I said this when I lost Roger, you may be what they need but you may not be what they want. And there's a big difference and you cannot take that personal and you gotta be okay with it. Doesn't mean you can't be powerful and do other things. And you're gonna ask me what I did afterwards, but I'm just telling you, you have to be prepared for that. And, and again, yeah, you pet your ass. They called me afterwards and said, God, you could have won this. It's like, but that was the choice powers beyond me made. And they made that happen. Jesus, they spent $15 million in that race of which almost five of it was spent to pound on me over you know some bs thing they made up and so how you battle that welcome to politics gal girl but it, it doesn't mean you still don't try and i'll tell you why i'll tell you why and i would have done it again knowing the outcome i absolutely would have. and the other thing is you know she went negative and she went negative because the powers of DC funneled money to a third party. And then they just, you know, pounded me on TV, pounded me in, in the mail, you know, and, you know, we fought, we fought back the best that we could, but there was tremendous pressure, Roger, on me from every swinging consultant out there going, you got to go negative on her. You got to go negative. And this is a choice y'all make when you're in a primary, but I got to tell you something, Roger, I'm all the Colonel I'm going to be. I have a legacy that is more important to me than any position that the United States of America can offer me. How I'm perceived and how I treat others who are like me, women and men who served and, you know, figured out is more important to me than winning any damn election. And I kept pushing back and said, I have to live with this after the fact. And, and, uh, sitting congressman said yeah but you'd rather be standing in the winter circle apologizing for you know obliterating someone than it and i said you've never sat in nuclear war cowboy and no i'm not going to do it because my legacy roger is about helping others along the way and if i nuke somebody and all that blowback all that fallout came back on me i would lose the woman that i am and that's why i said in the beginning i'm the same damn girl i was before i started running as I am today, and I sleep okay at night. So I offer you that. <laughs> I like it. You <laughs> have, you know, you had a groundbreaking career in the military. Did you find yourself during the campaign going back to your days in the cockpit, going back to your days in squadron command, mm -hmm. uh, going back to other days to when you were down at dark times, right? After, uh, you know, the primary before the runoff, you know, election night, uh, runoff election night, did you find yourself drawing on your experiences in uniform? Um, and if so, how? You know, how, how, did, how did your military experience translate into, you know, maybe making it easier uh, to, to handle a loss at the political level? Well, when you're a trailblazer, you get 
beat up all the time, Roger. I had lots of practice in that. <laughs> People telling you no at every turn. No, you can't fly that airplane. No, you can't do this. No, you can't command. No, you were never allowed to go to combat. You know, so I mean, that was for me, it was not that not that big a deal. What what I drew on from my military is discipline, is leadership. Uh, my entire staff, you know, um, trying to train them to be the next generation to come up and then by extension others. And again, ask me about that, what I did afterwards. Uh, it allowed me to stay very focused on and um, pilots tend to be very compartmentalized people. So it was like, I was like just going to bring up that word. Yeah, yeah we, Can we're you describe very, that for folks? Yeah, so, so it's like, yeah. you know, you're in call time and it's like, that's all I'm in. I ain't worried about, you know, drama over here and this and that. But the only thing I ever let my mind go was what the hell are we having for lunch? What are you guys ordering me for lunch kind of thing? <laughs> but I mean, I am on when I am on, I am on. And, and you know, I don't go over here and do all this other stuff. And so that makes you very, very effective. And it makes you got to remember for every hour you're on call time, there's two hours of somebody did staff work behind you. You know, so when you when you excuse my language, when you dick around in call time, you're wasting your staff's time too and oh by the way you're paying them so it's your money you're pissing away if you're not effective and efficient and you know you get in the call and then you get out and you know and i'm good at that you know i'm i do pilot speak people just they're like huh i'm like roger that and then we're done <laughs> you know so and i could get away with it because i'm a pilot and so when i'm on the horn with somebody and they're giving me it was the best of times this was the worst of times look i'm, I'm looking for money have you got any money can i have it please <laughs> Yes that or no, really I'm gone. That's the grind, right? That's what people don't, you know, they see <laughs> they see the West Wing or Veep and they just assume it's wonderful with, you know, uh, orchestra playing in the background as you're doing this, but it is. It's a grind. grind right? It's a grind. It's, but we've grind, we ground before. I mean, go go live in Iraq, you know, and you, yeah. your teeth grind with the food you eat, you know, go deploy to some godforsaken country. And, you know, so for me, you know, running a campaign was, was it was different but it certainly was not as hard and stressful okay so there were days that were very stressful as you know as commanding troops and trying and you know i remember one time on the coast we we have to have an emergency call and i'm like huh did somebody die and they're like no we have we have an emergency call somebody said something bad about you i'm like unless somebody's dead it's not an emergency so never use that word with me again <laughs> so yeah, it's it's you know we come from the, we come at this with a different level mm -hmm. of perspective on those kinds sense of yeah a sense of enormity here. It's like, you on. know what? One of the things that struck me, I like you have an aviation background. Although I wasn't mm -hmm. a pilot, I was a backseater. So thank you uh, for uh -huh. uh, keeping everyone alive uh, in your care. Um, <laughs> the thing that you know we talk about compartmentalization, which is good, and I was going to bring that up is yeah. part of that we teach you is, you know, you put your, whatever emotion you're feeling, whether it's stress from home or yeah. on the political side, right? It's a bad call. Somebody yelled at you on the phone. You take that, you put it into a little compartment and then you move mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. But what I found was easier in the military was kind of letting that emotion go because the mission was about other people, right? It yeah. was about the United, it was about supporting and defending the constitution of the United States, right? Yeah. For me on the political side, it was a little tougher because those emotions come back around to you at the end of the day because you are the product that you're trying to sell, that your staff is trying to sell, and it's a little tougher, at least it was for me, to kind of get over those, those feelings or emotions when somebody said, like, you know, uh, you have no chance or... They know, reject you. The, yeah, they the reject rejection. you, right? So yeah, how do you... How did you deal with that, right? It, it, it's a very, you know, running for office is a very personal, you're very public, you're very vulnerable in a very public way. You know, how did you tackle that? And how did you set yourself up to be clearly that, I mean, the resilient person that you are? Well, I call it armoring up. You know, again, I hearken back to my trailblazing days and, you know, I had lots of opportunities to armor up. And I, what I told myself when I was young and, and breaking all those barriers, they're not really mad at you, Kim. They're mad or they're resentful for what you represent, a change in the military. The fact that a girl can do the same thing you, you know, 
Steve Canyon boys out there all can do, you know, all that kind of stuff. So if you always make it about not you personally, but what you represent, it buys you a little bit of distance between the personal and, you know, what you're going after. So I always kind of, you know, most people's personal space is, you know, three feet because that's the, the length of your hand, right? Or your arm stretched out. And so if you'll put your campaign at the end of your outstretched hand and say, this, this is it, make it a third entity because it's a campaign. It's not a person, you know, you're the great analogy of you ain't the quarterback cowboy, you're, you're the football, they're trying to move you down the field. And you, you know, again, let me use my football analogy, you are representing something you're playing, you're a part of a team that's trying to get values and a voice and stand for things. So you're about bringing those things out. And when they reject you on the phone, they're just rejecting the messenger of the value system that you've put out in front of you. So that's that's why when you go to training, you hear them say, get your values, get your values. And you know, those of us that <laughs> worked in the military, you know, you got your three main points. You <laughs> tell them what you're gonna tell them, you tell them, and then you told them what you just told them kind of thing. And if you stay on that, um, I, you'll be okay. But you're right, Roger, I think the best troops I ever commanded were those that had good resiliency before yeah. we ever deployed. Yeah. And we worked very hard in the military. We're not as good at it as we, we used to be. That's what happens when you're in freaking combat for two damn decades, you know. Yeah. But I would say that to to folks that run, you know, whatever it is that helps you be resilient and whether for an introvert, um, it's very challenging because it's absolutely wearing, right? Yeah to be on, I think you're kind of an introvert and it's just like, oh my God, by the end of the day, it's like, you know, the dementors <laughs> came and sucked the life right out of you. Like, yeah. I, so whatever refuels you, which tends to be, cause my hubby's, I'm married one of them, you know, you, you go away, be quiet, just be in your space, do whatever it is you need to do. For me, I'm an extrovert. So it's like, I'm a gerbil on Red Bull by the end of, you know, <laughs> call time because I'm so high from yakking with all these people. I mean. I don't mean to say it, but I drank a lot of booze while I was running just, to, just to unwind, you know, and it's like, oh my God. And we had walkabouts every day. We'd take a break, we'd walk all around, you know. And We advocate oh, for responsible drinking on this podcast. There you go. You know, if you need help, come go to AA. But yeah. I'm just saying, you just, you got to find a way to wind down. Otherwise you lay at night, like you said, and flip flop, flip flop, yeah. you know. So those are kind of, that's a couple suggestions that I had, probably more intel than you wanted, but yeah. No, it's all good. You know, you talked, <coughs> excuse me, we're I'll try to transition a little bit here to talking about values, right? And how mm -hmm. important they are. And it seems more and more these days, like you look around and there's only one party that seems to be holding true to its values. And, you know, the, the catalyst for this show, I've been thinking about this for a long time. The fact that you know, 80% of candidates who run across the country every year lose their election. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about that. But it was yeah. really driven home for all of us on January 6th when we saw just exactly how not to lose an election, right? Yeah. And I felt very personally devastated by the insurrection at the Capitol, what it meant you know, sort of in the history of our country to see yeah. that kind of depravity and just uh, just open destruction, not just of our, you know, rhetorical institutions, but literally of the, the hallowed halls upon which, you know, our government rests, our constitution rests, and the things you and I swore our lives to protect our entire careers. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your reaction to that and what you think our way forward is as a country after such a just historically infamous and sad event for our country. Yeah, everybody has their reaction. I, I was uh, sitting there and somebody said, oh, you got to turn the TV on and watch. And I said, no, I don't, you know, and that's, I think that's probably the short answer is 
there's nothing you and I could have done. It's funny. I'll just tell you real quick. My mom calls. She goes, oh, my God, if you'd have gotten elected, you would have been there in the chamber and on and on. And a part of me goes, yeah, yeah, I hear you. And then my my, you know, fangs that come out are like. I sure as hell wish I was those SOBs. I'd have showed them. You know, I got myself shot or something. It's like, God, you sons of bitches. You know, I said, this is going to suck that I survive Iraq and flying for 5,000 hours and get my ass killed in the damn Capitol. Blah, haunt all you. you know? So, you know, that's, that's, the, that's in my head. That's what's going on in your head. You know, you're just, of course, you're nuts. But, you know, I, I think. I think you have to look at it this way, Roger, that the democracy got tested to the brink. I mean, it truly did. The January 6th was really a, a, an, a, a tipping point for our nation as to how scary it could be. And, and nobody should have been surprised. I hate to tell you this, but if you'd been a student of history and those of us that have you know, studied military history, how democracies rise and fall, none of that was a surprise to me, at least. And I'm just speaking for myself and probably most of the GOs out there in 06 isn't probably you all. So, but what what is what is comforting, maybe let me say it this way, is the fact she held, that the nation held. You know, she got tested and she held. We had a peaceful transfer of power. We have someone who's duly elected sitting in the White House who's doing the best job that he can to try to help save American lives. The things that need to be done on day two started to get done. And the focus came off of the guy in the Oval Office and back to the American people, which is where it needs to be. And so to speak to those 71 million that voted for him and the 100,000 that breached the Capitol is they are still Americans and they still deserve a government that can work for them. And what is so frustrating because I live in, I live in the red country out here in West Texas, is they don't feel that's the case. And somewhere in our democracy, we got to figure out how to serve all Americans. And it shouldn't take someone like the likes of the former president, you know, to make them feel that he's their answer, which is just like he's the antithesis of, <laughs> of the people who live in the trailer across my way. I mean, he, he'd give a rat's ass about you and your family. So we got to figure out how to bridge that and how to speak to them in a language that they understand. And sometimes, you know, on the D side, we get some damn elite and we talk too freaking much trying to solve a problem. And it just, you know, you, you gotta just, it's mid, mid America is what we've lost. I mean, we got the coast, but it's just like, come on. So, you know, I, I hearken back to my farmers you know, if you can't sit on a fence and chew on a piece of grass and have a conversation with the dude that's running a tractor, you're never you're never going to get them on your side. I mean, you got to be able to speak to them in their language. And that's why I thought I'd make a hell of an ag commissioner because, man, I can do that talk. Yeah. <laughs> I know all the John Deere parts. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I always said, you know, on the trail, you know, you got you to gotta meet people where they're at. And that exactly. takes time. It takes investment and it isn't something mm -hmm. that, you know, a political strategy that's ginned up in a state or national capital can necessarily do. It takes a grassroots and like truly grassroots, right? Yeah. Like many people who have skin in the game in their communities to, to do that work and have those conversations. And, you know, we need, we need to get back to that because we're not doing a whole heck of a good job with that right now. And that, that's, concerning. you know, the other thing, Roger, you say what, what January 6th did is, you know, it tested the democracy she held. The other thing it did is it, it was a hell of a civics lesson for 101. Because most people think that in November, ah, he gets elected, you know, the guy gets elected and we're all good to go. Yeah, so now we right. understand how our system really works. And it really did fire up um, a nation that I would argue had been kind of politically disengaged. That until 2016, we're all over here, you know, watching Game of Thrones and, you know, sipping our, you know, whatever, whatever. Yeah. yeah. And not really, yeah, whatever. Let, let the guys in DC do that. And we see what happens when you're not active within your own democracy. I mean, it ain't a, it ain't a spectator sport people, you know, get in the game with us and don't sit on the sideline and spew criticism in the cheap ass seats, you know, yeah. get your butt in the game with us. So, that yeah. is, and that's the thing that I think, 
is what's next for us on, a, on the mm-hmm. D side, which is we got all these people engaged between 2016 and 2020. Joe Biden won the White House. We barely have the Senate. We barely have the House. Mm-hmm. That isn't the end. We can't go back to pre-2016 because we know what happens, right? They're yeah. not the Trump family and the cabal. They're not going anywhere, right? They're not done. They're here for a long time. And this is going to be a generational, I think, struggle to show people, no, this is this is how you behave in a democracy. This is what voters ought to reward. We're going to have to make that case fence post by fence post, yeah. right, like you say. But anyway, that's a that's a topic for a whole freaking, <laughs> we could talk about that for days. But I, I got two I got two questions for you. Um Dude. Well, uh, as we wrap up here, the first is, what surprised you the most about running for office? <laughs> That's a good question. I'm not. I'm not sure I was ever surprised as I was. Yeah. I, I wasn't surprised. I'll just answer it that way. There were many frustrations and. Again, when you first run, the very first first time you run, you're just you're just just starry eyed, and it's so exciting, and on and on. And then the second time you run, you're just like, oh my god, this is hard, you know. And, and it is. It's just you and I joked about it earlier. It's a grind. But you know, the days I, I tell a story of um, a lady who you know people tell this story all the time. I'm sure we're you know, she sent me a check for $5 and it's written in kind of scratchy handwriting. And it was a woman from my church and I never cashed the check. And I always had it pinned up on my call time, you know, up on my wall, because I always wanted to be reminded, Roger, of who you really are running for. Because like you said, your ego gets all in you, especially, you know, my video went viral and people that's I'm a good video. Hardball. Yeah. And I'm over here talking to, you know, MSNBC and, you know, yeah, yeah, whatever. But at the end of the day, you are working for that woman who probably on a fixed income wrote you a $5 check, which is, you know, big bucks. Yeah. And so it's just a subtle reminder. So I never was surprised. I was more humbled now and again by the generosity of people, by the stories people would tell you about, you know, I would do a thing every night on my drive home where I'd take 15 to 20 donors who'd give me $25 or less, like on, you know, on our email system. And I would call them from all over the country um, just to thank them. And it always made me feel good because you can know, imagine getting a call from, you know, someone running for Congress and you gave them $10, you know, and just those were the funnest calls it just it was really that and that again i just i don't know it was just and and when you make those calls let me just finish my thought here when you make those kinds of calls you are reminded that america is is a good place to be and that people in america want good people to lead them and that they're they're hopeful and they are believe in this system and they believe in you and they believe in leaders that that you know want what's right and 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 do what's right for the greater good and that that's the thing i think we need to leave folks with you know all, yeah we got lots of challenges in this country but i still after traveling all over the world and i lived overseas my entire youth i would not want to live in any other country yeah not at all agree agree <laughs> well i got one last one for you uh you and i both know there's there's life after combat. There's life after hanging up the uniform, right? Tell us what you're doing now, what you did okay. after after losing uh, your elections. Um, is there life after an unsuccessful political campaign? And you've given a lot of great advice this whole, I mean, this is therapeutic for me personally, but you know, is there life- You'll get my bill, Roger, you'll get there, my bill. <laughs> yeah, $5, please. Is yeah, there yeah. life- after political campaign and what do you tell people who want to follow in your footsteps and do this thing and and run for office and and engage in political public service so let me back into that if you want to run you get your ducks in a line don't wake up one morning go hey i think i'm just gonna run for congress because that sounds like a good deal to do you know you do yourself a great disfavor i 
talk to a lot of people on the phone and Roger, you can give them my phone number and we'll say, all right, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? Could you run for this? Can you run for that? You know, everybody and their brother jumps up and goes, yeah, I think I want to do that. And you have, you know, you have, you're like a stock, you know, on the market and your stock is worth so much, especially as a veteran, especially as someone who has incredible experiences. And you don't want to water that down by jumping into a race that you're not ready for and you can't even get close to the finish line. So pick, you know, kind of like pick your mate, pick your race well. And it, it doesn't always have to be the one that everybody sees, you know, the statewide or the congressional. I, I, I served on a school board for two terms. The other thing is there's half a million elected positions in this nation. Let me repeat that, a half a million. That means you can find something to run for that doesn't require you to work 60 hours a day on call time and raise $5 million because that's the bill today. So there are ways to get into the political game that doesn't, you know, doesn't require these, you know, big, big show, you know, be a workhorse, not a show horse. There, there's my line. And then this, and then the second thing is there is power in having this experience. So even though you say, well, you were unsuccessful. Yes. Here's the deal, y'all. You applied for a job. Roger and I applied for a job and the way we were going to get that job is we were going to get the most votes. The only thing that happened to Roger and I and the rest of us that didn't make it across the finish line is you just didn't get enough votes and you just didn't get the damn job, period. Doesn't mean you aren't successful, doesn't mean you're a loser. It just means you didn't get the job you were applying for. But you are a powerful person because you're now you're an ex-candidate. So let me just tell you what I did. So I came off of my run. Hell, I'd raised almost $2 million without much help from anybody on the outside pouring in money. And I pivoted to a GPAC. I supported 52 women who were running in Texas up and down the ballot. Now, we didn't do that good, but I still supported them because I felt it was important to push my fundraising capacity and the money I had left over and put it somewhere where we can make a damn bit of difference. That's number one. The second thing that I did is said, you know, <laughs> I'm a pilot. We have dash ones. We have checklists. You know, we have lots and lots of training before you ever put your fine hiney in a seat of a cockpit. You get trained up big time, right? Everybody does that. Same thing on ships, same thing in armor, same thing everywhere else. It just blows my mind that people wake up on a Tuesday and go, well, hell, I think I'm just going to run me for Congress. Get your butt to some kind of training. And how you do that is you better find some kind of books or someone who's been there, done that, and read on it. So, Here's what we're doing. So I am just turned in my book proposal in which I've captured the stories of people who've run, who've won, who've lost from everything from school board, city council to senator, from the Northeast to the Northwest and all points in between and all diversities. And by that, I mean, you don't have a college degree, you can still run for office. You come from first immigration family, you can run for office. You're over here in the middle of New Mexico, nowhere, you can run for office. So it's diverse in the, in the levels of government, the geographics of it, and the people who run up and down the ballot. And so the proposal just went out today and we're hoping that someone will pick it up and we will have a book about no shit, how to run for office that tells you everything. Don't look behind the curtain there, Dorothy. But it's that because no one does that. No one sits you down and says, okay, here's how the cow is going to eat the cabbage, cowgirl. And you're going to do A, B, C, and D. It's all this BS about, and I hate this analogy. And you can close with this, Roger. People are like, well, we're just flying the aircraft while we're building it. Oh, yeah. You idiots are not pilots because you would <laughs> never get an aircraft off the ground if it wasn't built. Build the damn aircraft first and then take it for a flight. Yeah. That would be what I would say to someone who is running for office. Number one, you better get your family in line. Number two, find yourself a mentor who's been there so they can help you navigate it because it ain't that easy. And number three, make dang sure you're doing it because you want to make a difference for everybody around you and, and not because, oh yeah, I like to see my name on a ballot, which most vets don't do. I know that. But, you know, get some wise counsel and sage advice before you put your toes in this. But at the end of the day, if it's run or don't run, freaking run, <laughs> period. Full stop. How's that? I like it. I like it. 
Kim Olson, thank you You're welcome, for your buddy. service to our country. Thank you for running. Thank you for helping other people run. Yeah. Thank you for just being you. I appreciate <laughs> you being on the show. Thank you so much. Well, Roger, thank you for doing this. You're doing our veterans a great favor. Thank you for your service there in the Navy. I won't hold that one against you, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let and it. If slide. anybody out there needs anything, you guys just give us a call. Roger and I, we're, we'll, we'll help you out one way or another. We'll get that done. Damn straight. Kim, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Godspeed, Roger.